Welcome to Earth Revolution 2013. We are still the home of the green scene here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, this is part two of an afternoon with Doug and Claudia Calmer in Lutz, Tennessee. In the first show, we looked at their beautiful passive solar house, their solar panels, um, solar thermal water heating system, and a variety of other aspects of the design that they created at their homestead. In part two, we're gonna look at some of the interior design aspects of the house, as well as their vineyard and orchard, um, Claudia's greenhouse where she raises tomato plants in the spring, the beef cattle they raise, and as if all of this is not enough, we're also going to get to see some of the incredible artwork they design using stained glass, wrought iron, a variety of materials. So there's a lot to cover. Once again, let's get started. This is our stained glass studio and it requires hot water to clean up stained glass after you've uh, got flux on it. So this is uh, a solar this is a gravity-fed solar system where the collector and this system is below the heat exchanger tank where I had to pump it on the house because the collector is above the heat exchanger tank. Heated water wants to rise naturally so I took advantage of that on this system and just put the collector down low and the heat exchanger tank above it. So this requires no electricity, no pumps. Uh, as the, the antifreeze solution is heated in here it naturally rises up to the tank and uh, loses its heat to the water in the tank and then falls back down and completes the, the, the circuit. Wow. So it's just driven by gravity and sunlight. This is a solar space heater for our stained glass studio and when the sun, winter sun is low in the sky uh, it warms the air in this panel. I've got a little squirrel cage blower in the corner here uh, run by a thermostat so when it, the temperature in the collector gets up above 85 degrees it cuts in uh, the fan and blows warm air into the studio to help heat it during the winter. Nice. And again, you've got like a dark material in there to help absorb the sun and yes. bring more heat in. Yes. Okay. This is just uh, sheet metal painted black in there. Okay. Very simple, low cost. So even though you, um, going back to the, this for a moment, even though you didn't build this yourself, you could, and if somebody wanted to, it would just be a matter of getting the basic materials that go into making this. This is basically an insulated aluminum box that's got glass on one side, and then you have the absorber in there. The absorber is a plate. It's, uh, in this one, it's aluminum. Some of them are copper, uh, and it's got plumbing running in close contact with that absorber. With the Freon running through the plumbing no, or, or no not Freon. Freon it's no Freon. This, is, this one uses automotive antifreeze because I've got a double wall heat exchanger here. I took a regular electric water heater, stripped the insulation from it, and wrapped copper tubing around the outside of it. So the copper tubing is one wall and the, the wall of the tank is another wall. With double wall heat exchangers you can use toxic antifreezes like ethylene glycol Whereas in the house, my uh, heat exchanger coil is actually inside the tank, so there's only one wall of uh, heat exchanger, and there I use a non-toxic propylene glycol antifreeze. So in addition to the stuff you're doing in the greenhouse, you guys are also growing uh, grapes. You have your own vineyard here. What is that? What is the main purpose of that? The main purpose is to make wine. Oh yeah. Uh, and we, uh, this year is going to be a great fruit year. We're going to have a lot of grapes. We're going to have a lot of blueberries. Uh, we, even so have, many. we even have some apples on our apple tree for the first time. Do you make apple wine too? Uh, yes, I have in the past, Is it but good? not with my own apples. This, this, you know, we're only going to have a few apples this year, but yeah, I've made apple wine, uh, blueberry wine, grape wine. I can um, vouch for her blueberry wine. It's really <laughs> good. <laughs> um, I also, you know, we do make, you know, I make grape juice, but most of the grapes go to the wine, but I do put away some grape juice and, you know, grape jam and right. blueberry jam, but, uh, most of the fruit we use, we make wine with. Yeah, <laughs> and you give, give it to friends at oh, holidays yes. and stuff. We, Why not? We, we like to share it. What's so. not to love? Yeah, and this year, like I said, is going to be a great year for fruit. Last year, we did not have anything because of the strange weather we had. But, yeah. Uh, but this year, uh, we managed to get by without things freezing. It's coming back strong. Yep. Yeah, yep. you got a couple of rows of grapes and I guess a couple of rows of blueberries. Blueberries, too. yeah. And then we've got some uh, cherry trees and some apple trees and some other unusual fruits that we've gotten from Adam and Sue Turtle. Oh yeah, <laughs> Adam is an expert in plants, that's mm -hmm. for sure. And uh, this is the greenhouse. This is the commercial greenhouse. Uh, let's see, 22 by 48. 
uh, usually start it up around the middle of February and fill it up with uh, transplants. Uh, the greenhouse is just a springtime business. Uh, I slowly get started around the middle of January. In the small one. In the small greenhouse and then by the middle of February I move down to the big greenhouse and fill it up with uh, thousands and thousands of transplants. My main crop in this greenhouse is tomatoes. Um, 26,200 and some tomato plants last year. Wow. Uh, sold every single one of them. Uh, we basically we do about half and half uh, hybrid and um, open pollinated uh, heirloom variety tomatoes. Okay. Um, I'm known around the area as the tomato lady. Mainly it's because I grow strong healthy tomato plants and I don't grow them in small packs where they get root bound. Right. They've got plenty of room they don't get root bound, they're healthy, they're strong, people right. come looking for me. Okay. If you had arrived here a couple months ago, this greenhouse would have been filled and overflowing uh, with thousands of transplants, but of course the season is over, the end of May, the last day of May is my last day, and uh, it's empty now. I'm a free person. <laughs> She's free from having to transplant anything. But you've got tons of shelving in here and you just fill the whole thing the up. The whole thing, I mean, even if there's a certain point when I'm still transplanting and things aren't quite moving fast that, right. uh, that I mean, every, even the floor is jammed with plants. I mean, oh my gosh. Every, every little space that I can find is jammed with plants. The cold frames on the side of the greenhouse are filled with plants. We've got several cold frames where we take the plants and we harden them off before we sell them. Right. And get them more used to the outside weather than... Okay. And, and uh, speaking of, that's another reason that my tomato plants are um, very popular is because I don't just take them right from the greenhouse and sell them. All the tomato plants go outside, get hardened off to the weather. They Tolerate. get hardened off to the wind and the rain and the sun. So they're more likely to survive when they're transplant transplanted shock. into somebody's garden. Right. Exactly. There's, there's no transplant shock involved because they're already tempered to the outside right. weather. Okay. This technically is, is a cold frame because it's just got uh, one layer of plastic over the bulk of it, but, but we heat it. But okay. this plastic is a uh, UV plastic that is uh, what they say it's a four-year plastic. And uh, if you take care of it properly, it'll last you up to six or seven years. And that's about it. This is a, probably on its seventh year. So every six or seven years, we change the plastic. It doesn't okay. have to be changed every year. And, you know, we just this is just pressure-treated framing uh, on the outside, so it's just... Stuff we put together, and I don't think we kept track of all that. No, I mean right. it's fairly, fairly inexpensive. You yeah, know, especially if you do it yourself. Like it's right. certainly yeah. paid for itself over the years. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. She does pretty well. Yeah. With, with it. I mean, we're not going to get rich here, and it's a lot of work, but it's it's done in two and a half months. Right. right. So that keeps it enjoyable. Yeah. If I were to do this all year round, I would get very tired of it. I can but imagine. Because I only do we only we only do it for a few months out of the year. I still enjoy doing it. And this is mainly your business. You're, you're both involved, but you're the main one that's like transplanting the tomatoes. I'm the plant manager. Okay. And you start them from seed. Yes, everything yeah. from seed. And yes. then okay. everything from seed. Yeah. So Doug and Claudia also raise their own grass-fed beef. Talk about that a little bit. How many head of cattle do you have? Right now we have ten head. It, it varies between maybe eight and fourteen. Uh, we've only got nine acres of pasture, so we can't have too many more than that. But this is something we got into when we bought the land. It was already fenced, and uh, we were looking for a way to make a little bit of money and feed ourselves. Right. They turn indigestible grass and weeds into a high-quality protein that uh, we consume, and we also can sell some. And do you supplement the grass feed with anything? Nothing. They get grass and dried grass in the winter, hey. Wow, and they're perfectly healthy on that diet. Yes, that's, that's that's their natural diet. That's what nature intended them to eat. They're not meant to eat corn or any other grain. We've been talking uh, earlier with Doug and Claudia about the design of the house from the outside and the thermal solar on your roof and the solar panels over there. And now we're going to take a look inside the house and talk a little bit about the way they designed the space and built the walls and so on. Let's do that. All right, come on in. All right. First thing you'll notice is a custom door. This has foam paneling inside it for a high insulation value. This is local walnut, so it didn't cost a lot of money. Um, the, this is a mud room. It's a great place for coats and boots and, and uh, uh, jackets and such. But it's also a, a way to uh, kind of insulate the outside from the inside, uh, especially during cold weather where you have uh, 
two doors that you can close. It's kind of like an airlock where you can close one door before you wander out the next one to uh, avoid uh, trading air uh, into the house. You know. What about these walls? This How is slip forming. This is an old building method that uh, we decided to adopt. It's again a, an, an idea that I got from Mother Earth News. But uh, you basically start with uh, wooden forms that are about a foot and a half tall. They can be two feet tall. And uh, they can be four, six, or eight feet long. I built them with on, uh, drilled on two foot centers so they can all bolt together. So you, you set one set of forms facing each other on the uh, footer. This wall is a foot thick, so they were a foot apart facing each other. Then you take a flat stone and put it up against that form, and you just fill in concrete behind it. Once that form is filled with stones and, and concrete, you let that set up, and you can bolt another layer of forms on top of that. Well, uh, and you do the same thing. You fill that with stones and concrete. Then once that second layer of forms is, is uh, set up, you can pull that lower layer, and this is where the term slip forming comes from. You slip that lower layer out and leapfrog it up over uh, the second layer because it's, there's wire going in between the forms right through the concrete that you can clip when you want to remove the form and that holds the form onto the wall when, when you don't want it to move. So you okay. can reuse the same forms over and over again, and this lets you do things like custom build stone into your into your wall that you couldn't do if you just had a poured concrete uh, uh, set up like they do. They form it all at once and pour it all at once. Okay, so the slip form is that wooden structure that enables you to form the wall mm -hmm. to the thickness desired, you know, yes. as you're building. And, and it doesn't necessarily refer to the materials like it's... No. You use no. concrete and stone here, but it can use other things as well. I'm told that uh, slip forming is used in building skyscrapers. They have big metal forms and okay. they do more, more or less the same thing. They just pour concrete into them and then uh, once that first floor is, is set up, they'll just they raise the out. forms up and pour the second floor on top of it. Okay. So it's an old building method, but it's still in use in, in uh, certain commercial buildings. Okay. And let's take a look inside the house too. Sure. Come on in. The house is designed basically, this is a direct gain passive solar house. It's designed, essentially we're living in a solar collector with a lot of thermal mass in it. Thermal mass is materials that hold uh, heat, gather and hold heat. So the floor being a dark stained concrete is an excellent thermal mass. The stone fireplace inside the middle of the house is excellent thermal mass. Uh, the low winter sun comes in and warms these, uh, these thermal masses, the floor and, and the stone work and that uh, keeps it from overheating here in the winter time because the, the, uh, all this surface area is absorbing the heat and then in winter nights it gives it back to us. We've had uh, winter nights down to zero degrees and with no heat in here it was 65 degrees in the morning. Wow. Now part of what helps it uh, be that efficient is nighttime insulation. So what I've done is made, uh, this is a material called Reflectix, it's a double bubble pack, and uh, we've made uh, nighttime insulating shades for the, for the winter. Okay, that's, and I see you've got that on all three windows. Yeah, uh, the upper windows are commercial insulating shade, and the lower ones are homemade. Okay, and I noticed, Doug, too, that these walls, uh, unlike the mudroom, you've got wood in these walls, but were these also slip form? No, no, this is a different technique. This is called a, a cord wood or stack wood. Again, a Mother Earth News, or an idea I got from Mother Earth News. It's an old building method. People, uh, this is a poor man's log home building method. The, okay. the rich men could afford long straight logs. The poor men could only get the short crooked ones. Okay. So this is what they came up with, is a way of, of mortaring blocks in, into a wall to uh, to make this stack wall or cordwood. I am not, I, it's one of the alternative building methods I tried that I, I'm really not that fond of because wood moves with moisture uh, and humidity changes right. and mortar does not. So uh, there, it developed gaps between the cedar blocks and, and the mortar Okay. And I ended up uh, covering, at first it wasn't covered on the outside and we had infiltration. We could actually feel the wind blowing through it. Oh. And that's not good in an energy efficient house. Not so good. <laughs> so uh, I covered it with insulation on the outside and stuck out over it and that solved that problem. Okay. So now it's pretty, it's pretty well sealed, yes. in other words. Yes. 
And will you still develop cracks in some of the wood and just have to kind of fix, no, fix that, that as you they're go? They're done drying now. Okay. It's, it's, it's acclimated. It's been there 28 years. It's, it's, it's acclimated, certainly. But we dried it for 15 months. The recommended time was three years. We just couldn't wait any longer. And, and uh, that is probably part of the problem. Yeah. Well, and you had to get the house done at some point. Right. Right. <laughs> and you did say that you sourced your stone and, and the wood and the other materials that you used to build the house locally. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the stone came off our property. Uh, the cedar came off a neighbor's property. I did a little work for him and, and uh, he gave me the cedar. Um, uh, we tried to do everything we could. The, uh, this is oak post and beam framing. I cut them off the property myself, cut the trees down wow. and, and with a chainsaw. Uh, ripped them to uh, square, and uh, used a wow. uh, used a horse to drag them down off off the hills here. That's actually. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. But we built this energy efficient uh, home for less than ten dollars a square foot in the mid '80s. So uh, you've got to pay one way or another. If it's not in money, it's in labor. It's going to be in labor. Yeah, yeah. and you you have the capability of doing that. As probably a lot of our viewers do, if they if they can learn the know-how. Well, this was built before the internet, uh, so my sources were the library and Mother Earth News uh, and a couple of magazines. I, I I really feel that anyone who's got a, a working brain and two good hands can learn about anything they want to if they set their mind to it. Absolutely, yeah. It's just having the will to do it. Yes. And um, while we're in this space. Uh, I noticed you guys have a fireplace over here, this, and this is where you... This is our backup heat behind okay. solar. In case we get cold, cloudy uh, winter days, we, we burn some wood. Uh, this is a uh, my version of a masonry stove in that it's got a lot of uh, thermal mass, but it also has an air space in between the firebox. This is an airtight firebox with an outside air intake, and there's an air space between the firebox and the stone surround. So it acts kind of like a, uh, a, a thermal siphon. It takes okay. the cool air from the floor and warms it as it rises through there and, uh, and circulates it on its own without fans. This also heats water for us. There's 30 feet of uh, uh, 5 8 diameter soft copper tubing wound around the stack of this wood burner. Wow. So uh, that automatically, as soon as the fire starts, that immediately starts running uh, warm water up to the solar storage tank that sits uh, above this actually uses this as a foundation. Well, so again, I think as I, as I mentioned once before, it seems like in the design of the house, you weren't just thinking about a single function, you were maybe thinking about how to combine more than one function. Absolutely. This does more than just heat as a fireplace, right. it's heating, it's right. heating water as well. It, it actually helps keep the house cool also. Because, well, there's no fire in it, but the thermal mass is at least 12 tons of stone there in the middle, right. in the middle of my house. So uh, instead of the house overheating during the day, this will absorb, absorb some of that heat. heat. Yeah. Wow. And that's just a naturally regulating system. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mother Nature does it best, folks. Yes. Well, it's a little bit of understanding how heat works, but heat wants to go to cold. So if you can understand a little bit about that, it, it's all pretty simple. And I've got to say the basic solar design uh, was initiated by the Romans 2,500 years ago. This is old information that's kind of been lost to a lot of society. So this is an old technology. This is old technology. But it's one that we can use in the modern day very well. Absolutely. Successfully. Absolutely. I have no heat bills. Yeah. <laughs> the company pays him, <laughs> folks. So I love this open design. I really do. And, and you guys obviously made it this way so that you could enjoy it too. Yes. And well, one of the things I like about it is, you know, I can be in here cooking, doing whatever I need to be doing in the kitchen, and if we have company, I can still be enjoying the company because it's all open to the rest of the house. Right. I'm not cut off like your typical house is, you know, right. where you're cut off, the kitchen is separate from the rest and Yeah. It's and it's very efficient. I mean, it's not that big of a kitchen, but there's plenty of room for doing the canning or, you know, freezing, and putting up food. We, we have our own garden, you know, big garden, and we, right. uh, we put up a lot of food. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice cozy kitchen. Yeah, and because it is this open space, to me, it feels much bigger than it really is. That's, right. that's the beauty of it. Right. That's what I love about that. Right. The, the, the cabinets are made out of local cherry that uh, we acquired from... Harvey. 
Oh, from Harvey. Yeah, yeah from Once Harvey again. again. Yeah, yeah. But I made the cabinets. Yeah, Doug made okay. the cabinets. Um, and a lot of the, all this wood you see is all local wood. You know, the wood in the house. All the, the poplar. Pop the poplar paneling came off the property. The walnut. Wow. The cherry. It's all local hardwoods. Yeah. And this is actually the wall, when we were standing outside talking about the house being built into the hillside, this is the wall that's actually sandwiched right, right. up against the right. hill. The earth comes to, the soil level is about there, so we're, we're about seven feet underground on foot level here. Right, wide open in front, but... Right. Yeah. Let that uh, southern aspect, the solar, come in the south side and keep the north wind away from you. Right. Let's take a look at a few other parts of the house. Sure. This is a pantry and utility room, and uh, down the hallway is bathroom and bedroom. Uh, this is all local poplar paneling. The bathroom is done in sassafras. Sassafras? Spalted sassafras. Okay. We are fortunate to have gravity-fed spring water, so we don't have any electricity or pumps to, to depend on for our water supply. Wow. Uh, and it's very good water, very sweet water. Um, low water use toilet. Um, low water use showers, but uh, you wouldn't know it by uh, uh, using any of them. The slip forming, I think you can see as we, as we came in here, uh, it's just uh, a lot smoother. Again, I, I couldn't see what I was doing when I was slip forming. You're working blind against the form, so you don't see what, you, what you've built until three days later when you pull the forms off the work. But uh, I think I got a lot better at it uh, coming down here. This little window shows you how thick the sidewall is. It's uh, 12 inches of stone and concrete and 2 inches of foam board on the outside of it. The soil line is just below that window and, and just rises up to the top of uh, this wall in the back. Right, okay. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful design. And the top is all just wood paneling? Yeah, that's, that's uh, local poplar and it's just framed on the top above it. I just didn't want to lift stone and concrete more than 7 feet above my head. Right. <laughs> That's a little too much work for... <laughs> okay. But we have uh, local uh, woods that are just wonderful. This is walnut, a walnut tree that died on the property. I made a, a bed uh, frame out of it. Uh, the, wall, uh, the window is cedar. Uh, the chest of drawers is cedar that uh, died on the property. It's just uh, locally available materials we use as much as possible. And I have to point this out. This is so pretty. This is stained glass. You guys also do that yourselves. Oh, you yeah. design the stained glass. Yes. That is just gorgeous. You put that in? Yes. Just as a little decorative item. It's actually embedded in the wall. Yeah, well, I was trying to get a little daylight into the bathroom, and which is not real effective for that, but uh, it still looks nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, Claudia, in addition to all the other things we've looked at, you guys also do stained glass work mm -hmm. and iron work mm -hmm. um, and all kinds of artistic stuff. Uh, this is a lamp that they designed. Tell me about this lamp. We don't do very many things for ourselves. Yeah. Every once in a while we have a little bit of time, we actually want to do a project for ourselves, and this was one of them. We don't make very many lamps. Yeah. And uh, people have asked us, well, can you make another one? Yeah, but it would be very expensive. <laughs> yeah, because it takes a lot of it time. It was a lot of time. And so we came up with the design. Um, we, I did the soldering. I, I put all the panels together, and then Doug did the actual assembling and the copper work on it. There's a copper base. Yeah. with the decorative solder on it and so he actually put it all together after I soldered up all the little individual pieces. Wow. Um, so each you can, have, you can have a night light, you can have a bright light, or you can just have a little Oh that's so cool. Night light, you know, if you just want a little bit of light. Like with everything you guys design, it's very well thought out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're pretty proud of that. We, we actually that is I think beautiful. we did a pretty good job on that. Oh my gosh. And may I ask how long it actually took you? No. I mean, you probably couldn't even add up the hours. No, because, you know, we do a little bit, and then we go do something. I mean, we don't, we don't really keep track. You did, know? You learn, did you study this stuff, too? Or you just kind of taught yourself? We kind of taught ourselves. We got a few pointers from friends uh, and uh, basically just went in our own direction with it. Wow. You know, and just kind of taught ourselves over the years. And they also, and let me just point out this table too. I want to take a look. And Doug, you designed this table. This is um, this is iron, yes. wrought iron, um, you know, around the perimeter. And then you did the stained glass work in here. Yes, embedded it's on a cement stones. board, so they're fine to go outside. Uh, we've had them outdoors weathering for years without a problem. Um, I make various designs, and we sell them at craft shows. 
Wow. And is this something you can make, uh, how, you know, easier than obviously than the lamp? Yes. yes. But still a yes. fair amount of work. Yes. About how many hours oh, for gosh. something like that? Uh, again, I, I really, you know, I do it piecemeal or, or I may, may make several frames at a time. And so I, I really couldn't tell you. If, if I kept track of my hours, I would realize how poorly I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Better not to think about <laughs> right, it. Right, right. But the end result is so beautiful. Well, thank you. One of the other uh, things we're proud of is this uh, stereo. Oh, uh, my. This is all oh, uh, metal gosh. work and, uh, and stained glass that, that we did. Wow. Yeah, he did the metal work, and we both did the stained glass uh, parts to it. Two, two, drawer, two, two drawers, drawers full of CDs here. Yes. We have a bad CD <laughs> habit. <laughs> that's a, that's a, not a bad habit to have. I love music, too, so I understand. And the top, and then, are these all individual pieces of stained glass? Oh, yes. yes. So you have to piece that together bit by bit by bit yes. and just glue them? Glue no, them on. Not, you, not, well, you, you silicone the pieces on. Okay. Yeah, and this, then you fill it in with... Uh, just like that tabletop, this is a cement board that's used as a tile backing in bathrooms and kitchens and such. And uh, we uh, glue the glass onto that and then uh, grout it. We just wow. use regular grout. And you sell items like that too? Uh -huh. well, that's probably a bit more complicated. Yeah, and that's more than we want to carry around to crash. Right. Yeah. yeah. Something Whereas like something that. Like that a little more look portable. Easier. Yeah. 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 I bet you do very well selling those. Yes. I've sold yes. a bunch of them. Yes. Yeah. All different designs. And his kaleidoscopes, that's another one of his specialties. I have one of those. A beautiful <laughs> tiny kaleidoscope. So you make these too? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh my gosh, can that, we? That, this is fused and slumped glass. This is actually uh, slumped over uh, in, in, in one of our kilns over a uh, piece of uh, automotive tailpipe to, to get that shape. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a uh, decorative solder. Um, this is uh, what I call a bottle scope. Uh, it's a glycerin filled bottle with uh, the objects tumbling inside there. So you'll never get the same image twice as, as, you, <laughs> as you look through the kaleidoscope. Oh, wow. This is a different design. This is a dichroic glass and uh, other types of glass on it that gives you uh, a, a nice image. In, uh, Through the window on that end. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And they're so pretty. Everywhere I look in your house, you guys have these beautiful little pieces, and I'm sure many of them you just... The did you guys make this as well? candle holders, that's Claudia my specialty. Does them. Yeah. 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 Both, the, the candle gorgeous. holders. Yeah, I call them candle castles. Absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And you sell those as well? Oh yeah. At yeah. craft fairs? Yeah. They're popular. Yeah. What don't you do? <laughs> <laughs> well... You don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'll take care of that for <laughs> For better or worse. Us there, you know. Okay, so once again, this is Earth Revolution. I'm your host, Susan Shan, and we are the home of the green scene in Nashville, Tennessee. And today we've actually been down in Lutz, Tennessee, talking to Doug and Claudia Kelmer, who have a beautiful, amazing 51-acre farm down here. And we looked a little bit at the livestock, the beef kettle that they raise and their greenhouse business, uh, and the grapevines and the solar panels and your beautiful house. Uh, which is Passive Solar Design. Claudia, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Sue. It's a pleasure to, to spend some time with you guys and learn more about what you're doing. Doug, thank you. Thank you, Sue. All right. And everybody, I hope you tune in again. Uh, peace, love, and recycling until we see you next time. <laughs>